is we're going to finish up uh, the week by looking at 1.2 and part of 1.3. We won't finish 1.3 today. So the first thing they mention in this section is just kind of a general problem solving process. Really, this is very generic. You could apply it to almost any type of problem you need to solve. But the most important thing when you're trying to solve something is when you read the problem, you have to figure out what do they want me to what do they know, what do they want me to find? Okay, you're trying to see what what is it they want me to answer, and what information are they giving me to help me answer that. So you have to determine those two things. What are you being given? What do they want you to figure out? If you have no idea what they are asking in the question, then you're not going to be able to figure out how to solve it. Once you know what it is they want you to figure out, you have to figure out a way to solve. There's many different methods. Um, when I do a word problem, what do, you, what do you, well, actually probably when anyone does a word problem, what do you think is a very helpful thing to do if you have like a whole paragraph of information and you have to solve something mathematical? A paragraph can be just kind of overwhelming. Yeah? You like mark in some way the important information? Okay, so you might underline or highlight important information, and then what might you do if it's a word problem with all that information? Like turn all of that into a, yeah? Equation. Usually, yeah, you're almost always going to end up making an equation. And what might you need to help you make an equation? How would they be? Like if I said to you, you know, Joe's standing 50 feet away from a building. He's looking up at the building at an angle of 30 degrees. Uh, the sun is making this shadow. Calculate the height of the building. It's a lot of information. But if you do something, it's a little easier to visualize. Yeah? Like draw it. Yeah, you might want to draw it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of times when we're solving a word problem, you want to draw something out, you're almost always going to make an equation after you draw it in a picture. Sometimes a list is helpful. Depends on what you're doing. Uh, if I said to you, tell me all the different ways you can arrange the letters A, B, C. You might make a list. There's only six ways, so that's not bad. Um, if I said, tell me all the ways you could arrange every letter in the alphabet using it one time, I wouldn't make a list. There's going to be billions of ways. So lists are okay if it doesn't get too big. And then once you decide on what method you're going to use to solve it, you have to go ahead and do that. Carry out your, your plan. So if you made an equation, maybe you ended up with a quadratic. So go ahead and now use quadratic formula or factor it or complete the square. Do whatever you need to to solve your problem. So we're going to look uh, at an example. This, we're going to use this example for a few things in this section and also something in part of the next section. And this problem is going to be about somebody that rents a car. And there's two different fees that they have to pay to rent the car. They pay a fee like up front just to rent it, and that's $15. And then they have to pay $0.20 cents for every mile they drive the car. So what's something here that's unknown? Yes. Um, how many miles they're going to be driving. Right, how many miles they're going to be driving. And that's going to determine the what. Eventually, this person's going to have to return the car, and then what are they going to do when they return it? They're going to have to pay. So there's really two things we don't know. One, we don't know how many miles we drive. And that will determine the total cost to get the car. The cost of the car depends on how many miles you drive. So we would say the cost is dependent. Cost is dependent. Whenever you call something dependent in that, that becomes the library. Cost depends on the miles you drive. So cost is dependent. X is going to be called your independent. I'm going to mention that later on. So, uh, anyone think they could just give me a formula that would represent something I could plug into and it gives me the total cost? Um, yes, uh, Angel? Uh, y equals 0.20x plus 15. There we go. 0.20x plus 15. 
So basic linear equation in y equals mx plus b. You've got a slope and a y-intercept. And that's it. There's your equation. So let's use that now to determine if you drove 50 miles, what the cost would be. How do you use that equation to figure out the cost of 50 miles? What would be your first step? Me? You plug in 50 for x. Right. Key here, you have to know what you're plugging in, where you're plugging in. You're plugging in 50 for the x. So y equals 0.2. Now you could do 0 0.20, but mathematically 0 0.20 and 0 0.2 are the same number. You're not getting into significance. Uh, so 0.2 times 50 plus 15. Okay, what's uh, 0.2 times 50? 0.2 is one fifth. Think of it now, one fifth of 50. Yep. 10 plus 15? 25. 25. So the cost is $25 to rent a car if you drive 50 miles. Questions on that? Now, if you drive 100 miles, should the cost be 50? Double the miles, double the cost. Why not? Uh, John? Because uh, the number of miles doesn't affect the initial cost. The mm -hmm. initial cost is the majority of the price. But yeah, at least small. in the beginning it is. If you drive 10,000 miles, then the initial cost becomes a pretty small part. But yeah, the idea is the initial cost is not doubled. It's just the mileage part. So in this case, y equals 0 0.2 times 100 plus 15. So how much would it cost to rent the car for 100 miles? Uh, 35. 35. Okay. So in both of those situations, you took an amount of mileage, you filled it in for x, and you calculated y. The formula that we used is called an algebraic representation of our problem. So if you see directions that ever ask you to find an algebraic representation of something, basically that means make an equation. Somebody that walked in here right now would have no idea that that equation is about renting a car and it costs 20 cents a mile. They would just see something in y equals mx plus b, and that's all they would see. The algebraic representation takes the word problem right out of the scenario. It's just a pure equation. So now, using that same scenario we just had, let's say that Sarah was charged $50 to rent the car. I want to figure out how far did she drive. And we're going to do this, I think we're going to do this two different ways. I'm going to show you, well, you're, I'm thinking the way you'll probably suggest is algebraic, but I'm going to show you another way to do it. So how how would you do this algebraic? Yeah. Um, Sam? 50 plus 0.2x plus 15. Yeah, you're going to fill the 50 in for y. So 50 equals 0.2 times x plus 15. Okay, and then we go ahead and we solve it. So we get what, 35 equals 0.2x. And remember, 0.2 is a fifth, so you're really going to divide by one fifth. So when you divide 35 by one fifth, or 0.2, it's like multiplying by five. So that's 175 miles. That was a very algebraic way to do it, probably the fastest way you could do this problem. But, oh, so that was the algebraic approach. I just put it up above. So another way we can do it is more of a graphical approach. So when we do it graphically, uh, we're going to use the calculator. We're not going to be doing any algebra at all. So on the calculator, what we're going to do is we're going to turn it on. If you have anything on the screen, you can press clear. You can leave it there if you want. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> But what I need you to do is press y equals. When you press y equals, you should see a screen like this. None of these plots at the top should have a black box around them. If they do, 
And that means the plot is turned on. We don't want that. On. So you can press the up arrow until it starts blinking. And press enter to turn it off. But hopefully most of yours are already on. If you see anything typed in, you can go ahead and clear it because we need to uh, we need to type something in. So does everybody have a screen where you can see the y equals and there's nothing typed in? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at our equation, which we had right here, and we're going to basically break it into two pieces. I want you to think of the left hand side as y1, and I want you to think of this entire right-hand side as y2. So what we're going to do is we're going to graph the left-hand side of this, and then we're going to graph the right-hand side. And we're going to look at where the two graphs are equal. It's kind of a weird way to say it, um, but does anyone have an idea what that really would mean? Where one picture and another picture are equal to each other? It would be where the two graphs what? Yeah, where they where they cross each other. So we're going to put 50 in y1. We're going to press down. And we're going to put 0 0.2. Remember the x button is right below mode. It's in the second column, second button down. 0.2x plus 15. Now remember the standard window on the calculator is negative 10 to 10 on the x and the y axis. The first thing you're graphing is y equals 50. What kind of line is y equals 50? Uh, it's either vertical or horizontal. Anyone remember which one? Yep, John. That's a horizontal line yeah. at 50. So it's perpendicular to that. Is 50 between negative 10 and 10? No. no. So what I would do, at least for the y-axis, is if you go to window and you go to y min, well, remember y is cost. Does negative 10 even make sense for cost? No, no you're not going to be getting paid to rent a car. So we might as well put the y min at zero because other values don't even make sense in this word problem. And y max, we need to be able to see up to 50. Now, I always like to go a little bit past 50 so it's not right on the very edge of the screen. So I'm going to set my y max at 60. So let's just hit graph and see what we have right now. Here's my line at 50. And that's the cost to rent the car. Now you're looking at the cost from 0 to 10 miles, because that's our x. Well, actually, you're looking at negative 10, which doesn't even make sense. But you're looking at 0 to 10. We already know how many miles it's going to be. It's going to be 175 miles. So this should give you a hint at what number you need to change in your window to be able to see where these graphs are going to cross. What number do you think I need to change? Yeah? X max. X max. And I wouldn't make it 175. I'd probably make it 190. Go a little past it. And while we're here, x min is the number of miles you drive. Negative 10 doesn't make sense. What's the smallest amount of miles you could drive? Zero. Zero. Now let's hit graph. And we already know we're going to see the intersection because we solved it algebraically. Oh, that's cool. We'll see it. And it won't be right on the edge because we purposely left a little bit of room. If you didn't, that might have been off the, you know, might have been too close. So now you should have a graph that looks like that. What did we say we want to find out about this graph? Where the two lines intersect. Where they intersect. So on the calculator, you're going to press second, and then you're going to press the second button over from the right in the top row. It says trace, but when you press second, it's calc. Second, calc. You should see a menu that looks like that. And you're going to do intersect. Now, once you press intersect, you have to tell the calculator three things. This is a very simple intersection. But let's say you had something like this. You have this line, this, well, let's make it different colors. The green line and the blue line. The calculator can only find one intersection point at a time. 
So if you wanted to tell the calculator to find this one, you would have to specifically pick the green one and the blue one. If you wanted to do this intersection, you would have to tell the calculator to use the green one and the black one. There's only two lines to pick from here. So, I mean, you can't really go wrong with this part. It says pick a point on the first curve or line that you want to use for your intersection. I want to use the blue one. I'm going to hit enter. Now it says, tell the calculator the second thing that you want to use to find the intersection. Well, there's only one other line, so I'm going to use it. So I'm just going to hit enter. Now the third thing it asks me is a guess. What the guess is for is, let's say you had a problem like this. You've got a parabola and a line. The calculator can only give you one intersection point at a time. If you take your guess and you move the arrow closer to one of the intersection points, it would give you that one. If you move a guess closer to this one, it'll give you that one. There's only one intersection point, and it's right here. So in this particular problem, the guess doesn't matter at all. You didn't even have to move it close to that point. But it's good to practice so you know how to do it. You just take the arrow, hold it down, move it close to that point, and then you hit enter one more time. And when you do that, it should tell you that the lines cross at an x value of 175, which is exactly what we've done. Any question or did anybody not get that? Right. So again, there's some other features there, like the, the guess part that we don't really need right now, but it, that's just how the calculator does it. It will come in handy when we have more complicated graphs later on. Okay. So another type of problem in the homework where you don't have to write anything down is if they say to you, find a complete graph. A complete graph means you found a viewing window on the calculator that shows all the important features of your graph. How do you tell me that you found it? You tell me what you used for your x min, your x max, your y min, and your y max. Here's an example of a viewing window that is not good uh, for this problem. Let's do zoom 6. And it's done. That is not a good viewing window for this problem. Right? I can't see anything. All right? Now, even if I set the Y max up at 60, like we started out with, I would still say, well, yeah, you can see something, but that is not what I would call a complete graph. All right. So is it the, is it, it's just where you can find the intersection point? It depends on what you're looking for. So if you're looking for an intersection point, then a complete graph should be a window that includes it. Oh, I see. But if there are multiple, they're just having ones. You should have them all if that's yeah. what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. So however many. If you had, let's say, a parabola. Let's say I did um, x minus 10 squared. This is a parabola that's been shifted 10 units to the right. Well, I can see something, but that's not a good picture of the parabola. What I would consider to be an important feature of a parabola is the vertex. I can't see that vertex in that window. So I would maybe set my x max to 20. And now I would say that that is a good viewing window. You can see the most important thing about a parabola, which is its minimum. Or if it was flipped over, it would be a maximum. Right, just letting the intersect work on something like that, or like trying to find it, you need to move the points over to. Yeah, I could intersect, like if I had a line, like y equals, say, x, you know, like goes right through the origin with a slope of 1, I could find both intersection points of that parabola. I couldn't find the second one right now because it's off the screen, but I could find the first one by moving my guess closer to it, and there'd be a second one up here. But yeah, you can find both. Yeah. 
Why wouldn't you always just have a giant window if you can find specific points on lines anyway? So let's zoom out. We'll do zoom three, zoom out. Oh wait, you could just do zoom three to do like a quick general. Just a general zoom out. Yeah. But let's zoom out even more. Let's go negative eight thousand to eight thousand. And let's go negative really huge number to another really huge number. So that's just gonna give you an error? No, it'll work. So sometimes you zoom out a lot. And I asked you where these intersected, they're the same thing. They intersect, but it's going to be really hard for me to find it. It looks like it's at the origin. Because it almost looks like it's at the origin. And you oh, saw yeah. when I did zoom 6, it wasn't even close. It went right yeah. through the that's, that's crazy. I've distorted my window so much that I've made this pretty hard to tell that it intersects twice. I couldn't confidently tell you. I wouldn't bet money on how many times those cross by looking at that picture. So sometimes a really big window is not good. Um, so I, I already did. So you're graphing a parabola, finding a complete window, you just set your zoom so you really can see the minimum. In my case, I shifted it to the right. West, so I had to move right. This has been shifted up. If you shift up, which one of the four values in the window would you have to adjust? The y max. You don't need to touch the X min. You don't need to touch the X max. You can adjust just one of them. Keep in mind, though, that if you draw certain things, you will distort your image. So, like, here's a parabola x squared goes through the origin. If I adjust my y max to be a really high value, okay, watch what happens. I'm not changing the graph. How would that even work? How can the one side expand while the other stays the same? Well, it just zooms up further. Oh, sure. But the problem is, I've really distorted that parabola. So now, to me, it looks like it's, it's almost really flat, but it's because I've distorted my window. You're packing in 810 units on the y-axis, on the y negative 10 to 10, and you're putting 20 units on the x, negative 10 to 10. So if you put that many more units on one axis than the other, you're going to distort your image. So you can make something that's circular look more oval, because you don't have, your window is not proportional. That's what I'm saying. Is that why when you expand in both axes that are really large, the, um, the red line almost if it wasn't x equals y, it was almost like flat? Um, yeah, it could have been. It's, um, yeah, because I, I expanded one a lot more than the other. Like one of them I did negative 8,000 to 8,000, but then the other one I think I did like 999,000. Yeah. So I didn't expand it proportionally. Mm -hmm. That's why it looked really flat. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So that particular curve, when you graph something that has a degree 2 polynomial, call it a quadratic, that's a parabola. The general form of a parabola is this. It's the type of thing you see when you're going to factor quadratic equations. ax squared plus bx plus c. Right. Let's try graphing something else and see if we can find out a window for it. So I'm going to go back to y equals. I'm going to clear anything I had in there. And I'm going to graph a square root function. Specifically, I want to graph the square root of x plus 20. So to type in a square root, you have to press second. And it's the fifth button down. We have to make sure when we type it in that the x and the plus 20 is entirely under the root. We don't want the plus 20 outside the root. That would do something different. So when we type it in, it should look just like that. If I did want to get outside of the root, press the right arrow. X is the second button down in the second column. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to get another one of those variables, how would you select? Um, we, you have to change the mode to parametric polar. Or, uh, we're not going to do that until yeah, we get to chapter 9. 
But yes, you can use other variables. All right, so we typed in the square root of x plus 20, and let's hit zoom 6. Remember, zoom 6 is a window from negative 10 to 10. Now, I know that I didn't type in a straight line. That would be like y equals mx plus b. Square roots are not straight lines. This is not a good window. Square roots, in general, should look something like this. They curve. Oh, yeah. In one direction. Where they curve that way. So, if you look at this graph, which direction do you think I need to see more of to find the beginning of this curve? The x min. The x min. And if you think about this, what's the lowest number we can take the square root of and not get an imaginary? Zero. Zero. So, what would be the smallest x value you could plug in? Zero. Smallest x value. Negative 20. Negative 20. Okay, if you try negative 21, you're going to end up with a negative under the square root. That's not going to work. So what I would do is we know that the smallest x value is negative 20. I like to go a little extra. I shouldn't see anything in that extra because it would be imaginary. But let's just put x min at negative 25 and hit graph now. Perfect. Essentially, what you're looking for when you graph a square root is half of a parabola on its side. The other half of the parabola would be down here, but we don't see that one. So as far as finding a complete graph, I would say just write that down. Specifically, the four values that we keep talking about. X min, X max, Y min, Y max. So there can be more than one correct window that's complete. Uh, what is the, the, the general form of the form? Uh, AX squared plus uh, BX plus C. That's the general form of a quadratic. All right. Uh, is that the last thing here? Yeah. So let's. Quickly, I'm going to show you how you can graph. Actually, you know what? Okay, well, all right, let's do I'm going to quickly show you how you can graph individual points on the calculator and make like a scatter plot. I didn't feel you do that. So, if you're at any other screen, what you can do is you can press second mode, and that'll just quit you back to the main screen. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can start here. I think I just stayed clear before, and that's what I rid of it. And what I want to do is I want to type in this information. So to type in a table of data, you're doing something statistical. That's what a table of data is, statistics. So we're going to hit this button that says stat. It's the third button to the right, second button down. And what we want to do is edit the table that's in the calculator. So we're going to go to edit. Now, I already have data there. You might too. I don't want that data there. So what I want to do is just highlight a piece of data you want to get rid of and press the delete button. Okay, no, no, right, no. What you don't want to do is highlight one of the list, like L1, L2, L3. Do not highlight the L and hit delete like that because now I just blew away list three and I don't have list three anymore, uh, and I have to reset my calculator to get it back. Oh. So don't do what I just did. But highlight the numbers, just press delete, you're just getting rid of everything. Now, what you do is you put all the x's in the first column, and you just put the y's in the second. So let's put negative three. It's easier to do all the x's first. Two, negative one, 0, 1, 2, I think the last one is 3. This is symmetrical, kind of, you'll, you'll see in a minute. Once you put all your x's in, press the right arrow to go to L2, and now put in all your y's. You don't have to use L1 and L2, but it makes it easier if you do, because then you don't have to change some settings. So just use L1 for the x, use L2 for the y. 
Negative two, two. Negative two, two, zero. Negative two, two. I think the last one is eighteen. Yep. Very important. You have the same number of x's and y's. If you're missing one, it would be like writing a coordinate without part of the x or y value. It's going to give you an error. So we have the same number of items in L1 and L2. I've cleared out every other list, so there's nothing written in any of the other ones. And what we want to do now is two things. One, we have to set a window that will allow us to see these points. And the other thing we have to do is turn on a scatter plot. So first, I'm going to show you how to turn on a scatter plot. Let's go at this screen. It's all saved. You don't have to do anything else. Press second and press the Y equals button. And you're going to see you can do up you can do up to three scatter plots at a time. And notice the default lists that it wants to use are L1 and L2. That's why I had to use L1 and L2. Could I change them to L3, L4? Sure. But if you do L1 and L2, you don't have to touch any of these settings. All we have to do here, it says it's off. I want to turn it on. I'm going to hit enter. First, the first one. Yeah, just on the first one. And I can choose to turn it on. I can also change if it makes a bar graph, box and whisker plot. I can change all kinds of things. And I don't. Yeah, don't don't change anything else, other than go from off to on. That's all I want you to do. So everyone's plot one should have a black box around it now. Now, we need to look at our window. So press window. You're done at the screen. If you look at your window, what's the smallest x value that we need to be able to see? So I would go negative 5. What's the largest x value? 18. Three. So I would probably do positive one. Um, how low do we need to go on the y-axis? Uh, eight, so what would be a good number? Yeah, yeah. 20. How high do we have to go? Well, well, eight, eight, so if you've done everything right, you turned your scatter plot on, you set your window, you typed in the data, you should be able to hit graph. It's, that line is from what we did before. If I go to y equals, I can get rid of the square root. We're done with the square root. Or you can leave it. It doesn't matter. The point is, you should see dots like that. It's basically a cubic. Oh, and it's the, it's the squishy, squishy. The squishy, squishy. I just wanted to show you how you can graph those dots. And the calculator could automatically calculate that line in red for me. Right. Given these dots, right. Did you just the red I just drew the red line in by hand, but the calculator could give me the exact formula for that line if I wanted to. I'm not going to show you that right now. Now, if you don't want to keep seeing these points, you don't have to clear your scatter plot. All you have to do is turn it off. So you can press second, y equals, go back to your scatter plot number one. And we're just going to shut it off. So now when we do more graphing, we don't see these dots in the background all the time. Can you do that again, Yeah, so you press second, y equals. Go to the plot, and just like you turned it on before, just highlight off now and hit enter. Um, I'll put these directions up, so at least they're in the video, so you can, if you need to write them down or take a screenshot of it, they'll, they'll be there. But we just went through how to do all this. And I think that, that was it for that. So last thing we're going to look at, we're not going to quite finish up today, um, but is what's called functions. Okay. So functions, some things you draw in math are functions, some things aren't. To be a function, it has to follow a very specific criteria. So this is the first part of 1.3.
So to talk about what makes something a function or not, there's a few vocabulary words I need to mention, and I, I kind of already mentioned them, having to do with the x and the y variable. Okay, there's different names for these variables. The x variable can be called your input. It's your independent variable. It's also called the domain. Your y var variable is called your output. It's also called the range. You can also call it the dependent variable. All right, so it's just different names for the x and the y value. In order for something to be a function, the idea is you have a formula and you plug in an x value. If you only get one y value back, then it's a function. If you get more than one y value back, it's not. Okay, so you might think, well, how could you get how could you get more than one answer when you plug into a formula? Like this. If you plug in an x value of 36, what do you get for a y value? A negative, a negative and a positive 6. So you plugged in 36 for x, and you got positive 6 and negative 6 for y. That's not a function. If you were to draw this, it would look like this. It would be the top and the bottom half of a square root function. Yeah? It could be the other way around, though, right? Where if you were to put in, like, like if you put in a y, you can get multiple x's, but you can't put in an x and get multiple y's, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this particular graph fails the vertical line test, but what you basically said is it passes the horizontal line test. You might have already heard of vertical line test. I'm going to mention that in a minute. But yes, this fails the vertical line test because if you plug in one x value, you get more than one y value. A function has to be a one-to-one. -one. Plug in one x, you get one y. So isn't that most equations? Most, yeah. Um, not worried about that. Um, domain and range, just to kind of Clarify that a little. Domain is the things you can plug into a formula. Range is the answers that you get back. In general, we're dealing with domains that are real numbers. We're not dealing with imaginaries or complex. And you might think, well, isn't, can you plug any number you want into any formula all the time? No. You can plug any x value you want into that equation except one x value. Zero? No. Four. Four. Oh, yeah. So in this particular problem, we would say the domain is every number except the number four. You can plug anything else in except four, but four causes you to divide by zero. So that's one big thing you have to look for when you deal with domain. Could you plug in a number that causes you to divide by zero? If you could, that's bad. That can't be in your domain. The other thing you have to be careful with is with square roots. You can only take the square root. Well, actually, say it this way. What kind of number can you not take the square root of? Negative. Negative. Okay. So you would have to think, all right, what kind of values could I put here and be OK? Could I do zero? Sure. Negative one? No problem. Negative 3, that's okay. You can take the square root of 0. But what happens if you plug in like negative 5 for x? Yeah, now you're getting into imaginaries. The smallest number you could plug in for x is negative 3. You can pick anything from negative 3 and up. Is the reason that it's imaginary because you can't? Name a number that multiplies yeah. by itself and gives yeah. you negative. You just can't. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, so these are the two big things you have to watch out for with domain. Don't ever plug in a number that would cause you to divide by zero, and don't ever plug in a number that would cause you to take the square root of a negative. Okay, those are the two things we have to look for.
when we write functions, if something is a function, there are two different ways to do it. I've been showing you the y equals notation. There's also this notation, which does anybody know how to pronounce that? f of x. Same thing as y equals, it's just a different notation. When you use the graphing calculator, it, um, it's y equals. y1, y2. That's what it uses. If that's pronounced f of x. This letter can be different. Sometimes it's g of x. f is pretty common. And that's the example of our rented car problem. Yeah, can you start with g of x without having f of x first? Yeah, you can pick any letter you want, basically. Yeah. So, actually, I just act, I might have just done this exact problem. Maybe I did it with a plus. What do you think the domain would be here? What kind of numbers could I use? Yeah? Uh, anything greater than or equal to negative. Or no, that's the one. Yeah, negative three wouldn't work Sorry, here. Positive three. Positive three. That, that was the exact same problem. Yeah. So anything three or higher. If you're like, well, why not two? Well, try it. Two minus three is negative one. No good. And the range, well, this is where we use the calculator, and that really helps us to find the range. So I'm going to type in the square root of x minus three. I'm going to do a zoom 6. The domain is how far left and right the graph goes if you zoom out throughout. We can see that it starts at 3, and it goes to the right forever. That's why it's greater than or equal to 3. The range is up and down. What's the lowest that this graph goes? Zero. And what would be the highest it would reach if we zoomed out forever? It just keeps slowly rising, right? This is a parabola. So it's just going to keep slowly rising. So the range is every number from zero up. The lowest it goes is zero. The highest it goes, there is no limit. It just keeps going up. Um, all right, I guess we'll just try this one too. Let's type in x squared minus 4, zoom 6. The domain is every number that you are allowed to plug in. What kind of numbers can you raise to the second power? Every number. And every number. You're never going to divide by 0 here. I told you that was one thing to look out for. And you're never going to take the square root of a negative. There's no square root in this problem. So this domain is all real numbers. Now the range. It goes left and right forever. Slope. That's the domain. Does it go up and down forever? Uh, up and down. Up and down. It only goes up. Okay, if it only goes up forever, then that means it has a minimum. Where's the minimum? At negative 4. So the lowest this graph goes on the y-axis is negative 4, but it goes up forever. So greater than or equal to negative 4. Alright, and you said, uh, just to clarify, the domain was all real numbers because any number can be squared by itself. Yeah. There's nothing that would... You can plug well, 0 in and square problem. it, you can plug in negative 8 and square it, you can plug in 2 thirds, you can square it. And you don't have the problem here where if you plugged in like a certain number, you could end up with a square root of a negative. Yeah. That doesn't happen here. Uh, so, Sometimes what they'll ask you to do is evaluate a function, which means to take a number, plug it in, and simplify. The number that you plug in is going to be given to you. They'll ask you to put a certain number in. They'll also give you the formula they want you to use. 
So we're going to take a number that we're given, we're going to plug it in, and we're going to simplify. Right, so here's the formula that we're going to try. x squared plus 1. And let's try finding those three things. So in this first one, what number do they want me to fill in for the x? They want me to fill in a negative 2. Whenever you plug something in, you should always keep it in parentheses. Gives me nothing. That's it. That's your answer. Uh, let's do 3. What number do they want me to fill in for x this time? 3. I don't need parentheses this time because I don't have a negative. So you can just write this, and that gives me 10. What do they want me to fill in this time? A. A. So what would I get? A squared plus 1. This is an algebraic expression that we can't simplify, so we just leave it as A squared plus 1. So evaluate literally means take a number, plug it into the formula, and simplify it. Questions on that? I made a big deal kind of about those parentheses because if you type this in on the calculator and this, you will get two different answers. Negative 4, 4. So that parentheses are important. Um, I think I just left a bunch of space to do along. But I don't care. Okay, so last thing. I mentioned earlier that not everything is a function. If you plug in one x value and you get one y value, it is. But this particular one, it's exactly the one I showed you. Like if you plug in 25, you get positive 5 and negative 5 for y. That's not a function. If you graph it, it looks like this. And it fails a certain test. I think I said the name of it already. Does anybody remember what test you, you have to pass or fail to be a function? Vertical line test. It's called the vertical line test. And the vertical line test basically says that if you can put a vertical line anywhere in a graph and it hits it more than once, it's not a function. I would say. Okay. You might think, well, yeah, but if I take the vertical line and I just put it over here, it only hits it once. Well, can you put it somewhere where we would hit it more than once? If you could, then it's not a function. So, how about a circle? Would that be a function or not a function? Not a function. Not a function. Uh, how about, this is a sine wave. Functions Functions or not a function? Well, yes. Yes. That is a function. yes. That, that's a function. Yeah, the horizontal line test is something different. We'll talk about much later. It has to do with an inverse of a function, but the vertical line test tells you if something is a function. And that's that's one point two in the first part of one point three. So a lot of work. Uh, it's going to be on the calculator. Some of it might just be find a window. There's nothing you really have to show for calculations. You might just have to write down like an x-min and an x-max or something like that. All right. So yeah, that's, that's the homework for uh, Monday. The first part is on the graph and calculator, finding intersections and practicing um, with the window. And the second part is on functions, plugging in a number and evaluating, or seeing if a graph passes the vertical line test, stuff like that. Um, remember, we will have our first test on a week from today. I will be after school next Thursday if anybody needs to come for extra help. So this is homework. Uh,